Um, I DJ, although not frequently, under the name Viscrit. Um, and I do a lot of different things. You do a lot of different things. Yes, you do. You do so much. And so much for people. I think a lot of people appreciate you um, for everything you do. Um, I think currently, um, most people will recognize you by having an iPad in your hand, walking around the function, uh, setting up the lights, running them, making, um, setting the ambiance, um, sound, lights. Um, you do so much more than that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, you've probably seen me. I was very intentional about having my lighting set up be on an iPad mobile because what brought me to the scene in the first place is I love dancing. And so I was like, okay, if I'm going to get really into this, like, I need to be able to dance while I'm doing it. Okay. So if you've seen me around on the dance floor with an iPad, yeah, I'm controlling the lights. Um, I've actually only been doing lighting since recently. Um, I... BC or, or AC? Huh? Uh, before Corona or after Corona? Oh, <laughs> after, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, after, yeah. Um, I... I'm like a very means to an end kind of person. So I always was um, doing like different things, lighting, sound, etc., because I was throwing parties. And so I got into it because, you know, I, I just knew that like I could always rely on me and I got to, you know, if I need to get this done, like I'll be there. So I'll set up, I can do the sound. And then I started to invest slowly in equipment and then, um, I only started investing in lights, like, I don't know, a year or two ago. And it, again, it was for the same purpose. I bought a few lights that were kind of like multifunctional um, that I could use for my own parties. But as soon as I started to let other people know, um, like Gami, obviously, who, I, who was a longtime collaborator, um, that's when I started, to, like, people started to be like, hey, help me out with lights on, you know. And I started to actually get hired to do it too, getting paid. So. That was that was like, huh? Okay, uh, we could do this. <laughs> um, so that made me kind of recently like dive in and and turn like one of my many like sort of technical hobbies or creative practices into like, okay, let's like make a business out of this. And so now I have sound and lighting that I rent out, um, but it's fun. I'm like excited to do lighting design stuff, you know. It's like a creative thing too. I come from a visual background. I went to art school, um, and That's I've cool. been doing the music thing for like so many years at this point that that it's like kind of exciting to get into like using my eye again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there's multiple layers to this path that's been laid upon you that you've taken. Um, how did it all start? You said you went to art school. Yeah. Um, well, it started much earlier than that. We were just talking about my. Uh, hearing loss. <laughs> um, that's because I was like in the punk scene since I was really young. Um, How young? Like 12, 13. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's why like the the recent news that Churchill's is like kind of probably forever, forever closing to live music is like kind of hits hard because I started going to Churchill's around then, around when I was 13. Um, you know, Miami was the Wild West back then. So like you... They weren't checking IDs and all that? Yeah, like you just, or it was like kind of a known thing, like if the cover at the door was five and you handed the person 10 and you looked young, they were just like, you know, <laughs> it was like that back then. So yeah, so I started going really young. I was in bands and all of that and um, and I played drums and, and whatnot. So obviously like, again, a very loud uh, creative practice to have. Uh, so then when I started getting into like raves and all that, like. It's, yeah, it's been a long, <laughs> a long time. So I started off in the punk scene, hardcore, noise, like that kind of continuum. I was in bands. Um, and in like probably 2012, techno got really big amongst like the noise kids. I don't know why. Um, but that was kind of like the new wave. So I was kind of starting to get into that. And, and meanwhile, I was just like going to you know, parties and dancing to whatever kind of music because, like I said, I love dancing. Um, so it just kind of started to meld from there. It was like, oh, okay, I'm like, have this new fondness for techno and electronic music. Um, but then there's also scenes that play that, like that kind of music where you can actually genuinely dance like all night at a club instead of like bob your head in a dusty basement somewhere. Um, 
yeah, so that was kind of how I kind of broke through into the club scene uh, in college while I was in art school. Got a um, residency at a local club called the Middlesex Lounge. Um, Where was that? In uh, Boston. So uh, that's in uh, the Cambridge side of the river. Um, and yeah, so that, I went to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts uh, in Boston. And that's kind of where I got my start, doing stuff in basements. You know, the Northeast has a wealth of basements. Every house has one. So it was really easy to like buy a couple speakers and just start doing it. Um, but it grew from there. Uh, and I've had like different club residencies in different cities and then came back here and said, you know what, like I'm just gonna start my own spot. Um, so that was when the, the warehouse started, the 229 warehouse. Infamous 229 warehouse. First place I ever threw a rave at, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you said, you know, you started young with the, with the punk scene. What was your first like, physical like in place interaction with electronic music was that at a club was that a rave no it was it was like it was a noise show um this woman daryl seaver was playing on like a super old mpc or something like that i think some old akai or something like that but um and like you know it, it was not music it was a noise show so it was not music that people danced to but then um, she was playing techno and like people kind of started to get into it and I was like all right I can fuck with this what was like the environment like, like it lit uh, so it's this house called the White House which was like uh, kind of like a pseudo hippie house um, but also like just y you could go there and see all different types of music uh, and it was literally just like this dirty basement that was filled with like broken instruments from you know, many, many generations of people moving in who were themselves musicians and stashing stuff and finding stuff on the in the trash. And, you know, like, it was that kind of vibe, the place. Um, all the walls were covered in, like, detritus and people's, like, art projects. And it was, it was a cool spot. I don't know if it's still around, but, yeah. Um, how many were, years were you in Boston out there? Uh, I was there for, like, four and a half, five-ish years. Um, Make any other pit stops before we move back to Miami? I did. Um, I actually moved to Beijing. Beijing? Yeah. <laughs> How long? Just for a year. Okay. How was that? It was one of the best years of my life. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. What, um, was, what was the reason behind the move? Um, you know, like many people fresh out of college, I moved <laughs> for a partner. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't really have much going on. Um, she had uh, an internship, an architecture internship there, and she had graduated a bit before me. She went. She was supposed to only have like three-ish months left when I was going to go um, of her six-month uh, internship. And um, so I went, and I was like, okay, cool, yeah. Like I have, you know, I sold all my stuff, so I had a little money to like hold me over for three months while I like figured out what was next, you know. Uh, but as soon as I got there, her internship got extended for another six months. So I was like, I guess I'll start looking for work. And, you know, there's a there's a very high demand for people who teach English there. Um, so I started off doing that, but then just like very quickly dove into the scene, got a residency at a club. Um, and I ended up like through my residency meeting a lot of people. I met um, people who worked for an artist, Ai Weiwei. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, and he's he's very famous, so I was, I you know, I had been familiar with him, and I was like, oh, wow, I'd love to come to the studio. But when I met him, I was just like, hey, can I work for you? <laughs> and... Um, How'd that go? <laughs> it went well. Uh, I, you know, he told me to come back with, like, a portfolio so that I could, uh, you know, show him what I'm capable of. And... I remember it ended with him saying, I guess we can find some work for you <laughs> okay. and walked away. He didn't even say like, I'll call you and let you know when to come in, blah, blah, blah. Did he say he liked it? <laughs> like not even, he's a very intimidating guy. Like until he's not, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, he's like very serious, but then like he like gets real goofy once you know him. But um, yeah, so I, I um, 
I just went in the next day. Like, they, he didn't tell me when, but I just went in, and no one gave me any directions, so I just walked around and, like, asked people, like, what can I work on? <laughs> and then a month later, like, <laughs> they made a checkout to me, and, like, we had never d discussed what the rate would be or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, that, so that's how that happened. Um, so it was a very, yeah, it was a very eventful year. Amazing. Um, as a creative... What um, what inspired you out there? Um, sounds, visuals, or just culture? Like, what do you think you you took with you from there? Um, a lot, a lot. Um, I I went out there thinking like, oh, like this is going to give me another perspective to my worldview. You know, um, I'm coming from this perspective. This is a new perspective. I'm gonna add that. But instead, what it kind of did is it kind of like undid what I knew about my own worldview, right? Um, the culture clash was kind of like so extreme that it was like, like it, yeah, like I said, it, it kind of like undid knowledge I thought I had attained and kind of like I had a new worldview rather than adding to an existing one. Um, so it was just kind of like, that in a general sense, like perspective, like knowing people, knowing culture, etc. Obviously, like we live in a very like Western centric society that like, you know, between like American exceptionalism and all these kinds of ideologies, it's very hard to see things from outside of that lens. Um, and so, yeah, that was, you know, it was it was a, it was a good experience. Um, but also the way that people dealt with culture, especially within the, the, the context of music. Um, you know, China had been isolationist for so long that um, as the Great, Great Firewall came down, um, people started to explore other types of music, uh, but they didn't have conventions for like how you're supposed to act, right? So like, you know, we go to parties and it's kind of like, oh, I know that like, you know, techno is supposed to be serious music, so I'm gonna like step it out and have this look on my face. And like, you know, like people kind of like, they, they know that they're being perceived and they wanna act a certain way that they feel is in accordance with like the scene that they're in. Um, but none of those conventions exist for, for people there who are just experiencing the music like more recently. Um, so like they just kind of use their intuition and it's like really beautiful to see like what comes out of that and how free people are to like dance in different ways or just like literally like jump you know like use their bodies in ways that like That's so pure here yeah here would be seen as like like uncool or something um and i feel like that was really liberatory to be like oh i can play anything and everything and like people just kind of like they're excited to see what's where it's going you know rather than like I came for techno and I want to experience exactly that and nothing else, you know? That sounds so refreshing. Like, it's almost like a blank canvas of not having expectations. And it's like feeling something for brand new or providing a brand new experience for people, like, almost every time you play. Yeah. And I mean, I, and I don't want to say that there's like, that there's, that it's like a blank slate per se. Maybe like, <clears throat> I don't want to like misspeak. Like, obviously, like, like, people come from their own history, you know, they have their own context, they have their own worldview, et cetera. So like, you know, while that music might be new to them within the context, like I'm sure that there's aspects they're connecting to their own culture and stuff like that. Like, you know, I, you know, I can't speak from that perspective, but, um, but it is interesting to say the least, like uh, just like that, that feeling of newness at least. Um, and it's like sharing that feeling, even though the music wasn't new to me, but it's like reinterpreted in a different context, it becomes new again, so. Beautiful. So, what well, came after Beijing? <laughs> so I moved back. Um, I didn't know this was gonna be a whole autobiography. Um, I moved back and- Back where? To Miami. Um, what year is this when you moved back? 2014-ish, um, I, you know, at the time I saw Miami as being like, like a, a happy medium because obviously like people do see it as like a club mecca, you know, like obviously club space is a, a global destination for a lot of people in electronic music. 
I kind of generally knew that it wasn't my scene, but I was kind of like, oh, well, there's that. And then there's also Art Basel once a year. So, you know, it's not New York, obviously, or LA, but like there's still access to art and music on the scale that's like sort of like global, which was part of my intention. Obviously, I'm also like mostly grew up here. My family was here. So there was a lot of driving factors, but I moved back. Um, and I don't know that I ever intended to stay, but I just like very quickly got entrenched in projects. Um, I started throwing parties, obviously. I had been for years. Uh, I continued to do so. And then that led to just generally being dissatisfied with the offerings of corporate clubs in Miami um, and wanting to start my own, as I had mentioned. So I started looking for the warehouse. I started kind of, you know, asking around, being like, who might be interested in this? I knew I couldn't afford it on my own, so let me, like, wrangle a few people. And um, so I found, like, an assortment of people that were willing, but then as I was looking at warehouses, like, this person would drop out, and so that lease would fail, and then someone else would sign that lease, like, and we'd lose that place, and then I'd find a new person. It was, like, this ongoing thing for probably a year and a half. Um, finally, a, a, there was a warehouse that was like the right size, the right budget, and I had a group of people that were like ready to commit, and the timing worked out, and like we did it, we dove in. Um, Is this 229? This was 229. It wasn't 229 though, it was just called, like we, we intentionally didn't want to have a name, obviously we were like operating in a sort of legal gray area, in regards to like licensure and whatnot, but um, you know, it was so it was just like we're not gonna have a name. It's just gonna be like a place that people can go. If they know, they know. Um, people very quickly c took to calling it the warehouse, and that stuck for a while. For like the first year and a half, I would say it was called the warehouse to most people, and then it became two two nine. Gotcha. Yeah, or the two two nine warehouse, which got shortened. You know. Okay. Yeah. What was the first event that happened there? The first event. Oh my goodness. Um. I have no clue, to be honest. I have no clue. Because, you know, it was it was always intended to be, like, very, like, uh, community-centric kind of project. Um, so I don't even think it was any one of our events. I think it was probably an outside event. Um, there was still, like, uh, you know, Churchill's was still around, so the noise scene still existed. It still does, but, you know, shows are few and far between. Um, but at the time... It was, you know, it was a little bit more active, and so we had in in the early years we did a lot of noise shows. Um, I threw a couple parties here and there. Um, yeah. The the parties towards the end were definitely like the iconic ones that everyone remembers. Black Friday, right? Of course, you can't you can't talk two two nine without mentioning Alexis's sister systems Black Friday rave. Um, it was definitely at least top two of the most attended events that we ever had. Mm -hmm. There was like 700 people. The warehouse was only 1,100 square feet. So, you know, probably 600 at least of those people were out on the street, <laughs> um, which was kind of the beauty of, of 229, was the fact that it was just on this corner in corner, this industrial yeah. district no neighbors and so people would just like flood the streets the streets became as much part of the venue as the venue itself absolutely i remember people there'll be like vendors outside and people once in a while would have the truck pull up and then that'd be like the second stage mm-hmm yep yeah the classic i think the first time that that got used was um actually adar wanted to do a party with um well he wanted to like have records like that like a listening room but then the listening room very quickly became a second <laughs> dance floor. So, um, and it was like supposed to be all vinyl and all of that. And that was, yeah, that was one of the first ones. Was that during an annex party? I think it was. I think so. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I wasn't sure if it was the first time, but uh -huh. it was definitely a Dar. Was no, the, that was, was I'm pretty confident okay. that that was, that was at, at an annex party. And that was the first time anyone had like pulled a U-Haul onto the premises to use as a second room. Um, but that like, 
that became the the new thing to do and like every party after that that like had that anticipated a large crowd was like all right we're getting the 20 foot u-haul and just like putting the sound system in it love that love that yeah um why'd you stop 229 money <laughs> yeah i mean you know um there's a lot of expenses you don't expect you know like someone's fucking in the bathroom on the sink and it just falls off the wall and like Okay, like, you know. Is that a real story? Oh, yeah, absolutely, okay. 100%. Um, or that was fuck you. And, you know, so it was like, you know, that's, I don't, I don't remember what it cost, but I want to say it was like 600 bucks or something to replace because, the, you know, the sink itself was porcelain shattered. Like, we had to buy the new sink, had someone install it. There goes your money that. for the rental for the night. Exactly. No, I mean, we, we never charged $600 for a rental. Exactly. No, rentals were, like, almost always... Like mostly free, maybe like two hundred bucks. Plus, we would keep like a bar, like you know, the bar or whatever. But the bar never made any money either. Just like all, like through and through, there was no money made there. Like, of of almost three years of operating, three we years? Was three really? years. Yeah, wow. It was like I don't know, two years and nine months or something. Um, in almost three years of operating, we um, we broke even three times and made money twice. And when I say made money, I mean we made like 200 bucks. So that means that like for two, like 24 months or whatever, we lost money. That came out of pocket. It was anywhere, like on average, I would say we lost like anywhere between 200 and like 800 each personally. Um, when you say person, like each person involved? Each person involved, yeah. Each person involved. Who, who was involved? Okay. So it was like a long cast. Um, okay. It was um, me, Tara Long, um, a.k.a. Poor Girl, um, Skylar Schubert, a.k.a. Get Face, uh, who is now in D.C., and we miss him dearly. Uh, and then... Uh, Andrew Bird, Andrew McLeese, um, and Ochi Ochoa. Yeah. Oh, and and Gladys Harlow, who is like a noise scene person. Yeah. So when did autonomy come into play? Autonomy. So autonomy is kind of funny. Um, I'm like aging myself here, but um, autonomy started as a Facebook group. <laughs> that was intended to be like community resources. So it was about like trying to bring together people from the art, music, and um, activism communities to like work together on things, right? I have never liked how Miami is like not a very politically active city for a lot of people. Um, in a lot of cities, you can rely on people in the art and music scene to be allies to, to political movements. Um, and here, that's not really the case. So. I was, that was part of the motivation to start it, was to be like, hey, let's work together on things. Um, but then also to the benefit of, of artists and musicians who maybe are looking for other types of resources, jobs, etc. So it started as a group for that purpose, and then it kind of like morphed into this weird multi-genre um, party. So like the first one was an anti-Valentine's Day party. Um, and there was um, DJs. Uh, Nick, actually, Nick Padilla was one of the, uh, Louis of like, who's the founder of this, obviously, for watchers who don't know. Um, Nick Padilla was like uh, one of the first people who DJed for me at my first party. And um, so there was DJs, live music, uh, drag performances, and this crazy installation performance art that had like these crazy abstract kind of monster costumes and projections and all this stuff. And it was like, it was just all over the place. Um, Where was this? It was, I, I don't even want to say because like the, the company that does that is a, like, they're a bad gentrifier. And I, I learned that like, sort of the process of producing this event. Um, they tried to like take money from me afterwards and all sorts of stuff. It's messy. Actually, you know what? I'll name names. Made at the Citadel. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. They're, there. they're bad people. Don't work with them. Um, 
so yeah, so it was there. Um, and I kind of miss that format. I kind of have been thinking lately about like going back to the old ways of like mixing live music and performance art and all this stuff with with parties. But people want it. Give it to them. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll see. Uh, maybe coming to an autonomy near you. I love it. So we, you consider autonomy more of a party? It's more like a collective. Um. So it, it's a party collective. Okay. Um. I feel like when people refer to something as a collective, often they're they're suggesting there are other activities like maybe releasing, publishing music, whatever. Um, autonomy started first and foremost as a party that I was throwing by myself, uh, and throughout the years, like people have joined and then and then left and joined again and whatever. So originally it was me, then it was me and Skylar, um, and then more recently it's me, Laura, and Steph. So yeah, I mean, like we are a collective, mm -hmm. but the the express purpose of the collective is to produce parties. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. When I think of a collective, personally, it's more like the group of people coming together to for the purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, versus like I guess there are multiple purposes, but that's just kind of how I see it. Yeah. No, fair. I, and you know, I have uh, various times referred to us as a collective, and you know, whatever. But. through parties, autonomy came around. How did you, so obviously, you know, you started naturally, you know, producing, you know, the lights for these events, the sounds, you know, you learning the ropes. Um, how did you get roped into, into being a provider for these services? Well, the warehouse, right? Um, Post warehouse, I mean. Well, no, that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's like right. the warehouse. Um, I think I personally only ever threw in like three years through like, maybe four, five of my own events at the warehouse. Um, I was mostly helping other people produce their events. And so, you know, I had a few frequent collaborators. Um, and that's how I kind of formed those relationships with those people so that now, post-warehouse, people, you know, that I had been working with all this time, they knew me as someone who, like, has those skill sets, who owns the equipment, et cetera. So um, I think that that's kind of how that, that started. So you'd provide this community space for either free or for, for so cheap, and there's such a lack of, of venues here um, in Miami currently. Um, what do you feel like is lacking here in this community at the moment? Oof. Um, well, we can go back to the conversation about gentrification, right? Um, at the end of the day, there's one thing that an event needs, right? Like, we know that music is the thing that brings us together, right? But you can connect with people over music in so many ways. Like, obviously, we're, like, on a radio station right now that people are listening to on their own, right? Um, you can, you know, you can, um coerce around music virtually but an event needs real estate <laughs> you need a space to exist right like that's the most principal thing because you can you can clap your hands and stomp your feet and make music but like at the end of the day without a gathering space there is no gathering right so even though like the inspiration is music the kind of primary thing is the space and so living in a city that has this like, that's just like hyper gentrified and land values like skyrocketing, um, despite the fact that we're in this precarious situation with sea level rise and all of that. Um, there's just, uh, there's not enough affordable space that, that people are willing, the people who are in positions of power that they have access to these spaces um, are not willing to, to give that space to other people uh, or even to rent that space to other people cheaply, right? Um, it's it's just not feasible. I mean, we lost a ton of money doing 229, but like that was then when rent wasn't even that bad. <laughs> that space, I'm sure, the same space, I'm sure it's like quadrupled by now. Probably. I, I remember when we first started throwing parties, I would, you know, be like, 
like a thousand dollars for rental, like okay, two thousand was like the max. Like oh, that, yeah. that's like bare minimum now. That's like oh, yeah. oh you found a two thousand dollar rental where? Like it's like people hop on that immediately. Yeah. If if we had tried to, like people would have accused us of like being greedy or something you know like like now the game has changed so much that a person charging two thousand dollars is seen as like a community centric space and yeah I, I mean it's it's a difficult situation i don't know that there is a recourse right like i think that like um you know i've thought about doing like renegades for example right but i don't have the means to risk my equipment you know, if you get raided by the police and stuff gets confiscated, like, mm -hmm. I can't afford livelihood. to replace that. It's my livelihood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I I wish, you know, like, when you think of, like, I don't know, rave scenes of old, like, there was always some, like, you know, cultured rich kid benefactor who, like, owned a crazy sound system and was willing to just, like, bring it to some random warehouse or bring it out to the desert or something like that. Um, we don't really have that anymore, you know? Um, I think that, like, spaces, you know, um, corporate clubs and stuff like that have gotten really good at finding ways to fold in aspects of the underground into what they produce. And so they've turned a lot of people who might have sought out something like that um, into consumers, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think that, like, now you have this situation where, like, you really need people who are, like, self-sufficient within the underground. Um, and that's, that's just a, a, a challenge, right, for anyone. Do you think the biggest obstacle here is more of a physical one, which obviously the venues, but is, but is it coming more from, like, a per like the people is it is it coming from like a place of greed is it coming from a place of people not having community oriented thinking thoughts you know just empathy or care for the arts beyond what looks good on their instagram post or mm -hmm. some bs yeah well and, and i think we saw it happen in real time here right so like um Art was not a thing people in Miami cared about. Uh, you know, Wynwood used to be the arts district. It was a sort of disaffected industrial district. The majority of warehouses there were vacant and like in disrepair. Um, and that's where, you know, art, you know, these small galleries, artist run spaces. The first one in Wynwood was Locust Project, which was an artist run project at the time. Um, they moved in because that was the only place they could afford. And then slowly galleries, like small independent galleries started to trickle in and they started to establish something. And then from there, you know, we, we saw how developers set their sights on it. Um, but I think with a, it was Art Basel that really was like the major catalyst. It showed people in Miami that art is money, right? Um, for a lot of people, at least. So that was when, like, a lot of the developers, like, set their sights on on the Wynwood art scene and, and other, you know, circles of culture, Churchill's, whatever, and, like, started to try to take advantage of those situations, um, you know. And and they're, like, in cahoots with the, with the you know, the, the city of Miami, right? So, like... Um, you know, they got uh, Wynwood rezoned from an industrial district to a cafe district so that they could circumnavigate the parking limitations on certain types of uh, commercial property. But that meant that now, like, they could ag achieve the kind of traffic that they needed to, like, you know, uh, change the certificate of use on all of the different warehouses from warehousing to cafes and shops and this and that and the next thing, right? Um, they knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, and it kind of happens all the time. You see these same developers like coming in and isolating like certain artists, finding them and saying, okay, I'm going to give you something for free. Like we saw like Mana with the 777 mall, right? Free studios. That was an amazing community hub, right? 
but it was it was always like uh, the clock was ticking, yeah. right? Because we knew the whole point was to like try to revitalize downtown so that people wanted to move in there and they could redevelop the property. So to go back to your question, yes, it's a people thing, but it has more to do with the allocation of resources, the wealth disparity in Miami. So the people who are in positions of power are the ones with the resources, right? So, you know, yeah, like we can say there's like not as much care for culture or this or that or care for community. Um, but I think ultimately like you can have a lot of care and you can put a lot of energy, but if you don't have resources, you don't have resources and that's that. Perfectly said, truly. Um, you've been in the scene long enough to just literally see it go from when Wynwood was like this beacon of hope, like this this wild, wild west almost, you know, 2014 to 2016 was like, wow. Like yeah. that was fun to see it now. Um, what do you think's the biggest thing people could do to try to change that? Like, is it like advocating? Is it trying to change? Like I, I see so many people, creatives like who are natural, amazing, whether it's in music, visual arts, Etc. Um, they don't find it sustainable and they leave Miami. Yeah. Do you think it's in a way convincing these creatives to stay here and, you know, try to create this community to, I don't know, like I, 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 I'm so stubborn, like myself personally, that I want to see Miami succeed. I want to see Miami become wholesome. Like I want to see like people thrive here for their art. Mm -hmm. um, I have moments I lose hope, but I'm, I'm consistent in what my goal is. And I don't know, I think you're one of the few people I see that like, I see you and you give me hope. You know what, likewise. Aww. It's nice to work with you. It's been a pleasure. Um, I, I think Miami has very particular challenges. Um, as we said before, there's, you know, it's not a city that's like known for political engagement. That has actually changed um, since the uprising during COVID, like, um, or during the, the lockdown, I should say. Um, like, it, it is starting to change. But I think that that's one of the major hurdles because at the end of the day, that's where the hope is, right? The hope is in agitation, right? In, in getting people concerned, um, regarding these issues so you know um putting pressure on cultural institutions to actually support the homegrown talent things like that right which you're seeing you know you happen from time to bit. time yeah. you know people are starting to have those conversations a little bit um and you know and sometimes when that happens, the talent just gets folded into that world, you know, and, and those people, you know, you, you achieve, you know, by, by making contact with them, you achieve opportunities and, and then now you're in that world and you're playing the clubs and whatever. And I don't know, like, I'm not in a position where I would ever fault anyone, one, for like taking opportunities and two, leaving Miami, right? Like it, it is a struggle. Obviously I've put a very big chunk of my life into trying to like make the scene here work and make it sustainable for like people in the underground who like, you know, who's, who are more, more concerned about exploring new territories of music than they are about like, you know, catering to a sound that sells drinks or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, where does the hope lie? I think, yeah, I think ultimately, like, that's that's where the hope lies. The hope lies in, like, forming coalitions with, like, political movements, agitating, getting people concerned, like, you know, put pressure on these cultural institutions to, to you know, dedicate more resources to the underground um, and locals, um, push for local government to, you know, put grant money in the right places. Uh, you know, we do have like the Downtown Development Association and like all these other like granting institutions that like do give money to cultural things, but but who's receiving it, right? Um, is it ultimately something that's gonna, that's going to add value for tourists or locals, right? Because that's the problem is a lot of the cultural 
the money that's like coming from grants and things like that, there's this kind of undercurrent of like, oh, well, like, yes, it adds to the culture, but like the culture is still being primarily consumed by tourists. So I think, you know, that, you know, maybe just like setting our sights on, on people who do have resources who could maybe reallocate those, you know, um, redistribute their resources and their wealth um, and, and just put pressure on them to, to understand like what actually makes their ecosystem tick. I mean, half of the people who work at these clubs are people who, you know, they want to work in nightlife in a general sense. Or the same with museums, right? Like it's like young artists who are like, well, I have an art degree and I want to be a practicing artist, but like I got to pay the bills. So where should I, where can I get a job? I guess I can get a job at an art institution. I mean, that is my own story, <laughs> you know? So it, it's like it, you do that, but then if those resources don't actually come back to the community, who are they serving? So wise, so wise. All right, I think we've talked about enough negative stuff. <laughs> Who's doing it right, whether it's here in Miami or abroad? Oof. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, like I think that... I don't... Now? Yeah, I, I would say that there's different ways... Uh, there's different tactics that people do right. I don't think anyone's doing it right, right? Because, like, I don't think there is a sort of utopian ideal because it can't exist here, right? Like, the forces that are here prevent it from being possible. Um, I would say Miami Community Radio um, is definitely 100% like uh, the least compromised group I can think of. <laughs> Not that they're compromised at all, but it just like, you know, I guess when I started talking, I was thinking more about like um, collectives who throw events. But um, as far as like events are concerned, because we need space to occupy, like you have to play the game to some degree. Um, and, and so that prevents some aspects of doing it right, so to speak. Um, Let me rephrase that last question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's inspiring you? Uh, definitely, I would say, I mean, I, I'll reiterate uh, MCR, but um, as far as events are concerned, um, I really like the sense of community that Prohibida has. Um, I see how, like, they work with volunteers and how they just, like, have built this sense of community. Uh, and, and I like that. Um, it inspires me. I also like how they push boundaries with, like, the kinds of music that, that they're willing to showcase. Uh, we have definitely been caught in a techno, like, spiral for a couple of years now where like the bulk of the underground is, is exclusively that and I love techno but you know variety's nice yeah yeah spice of life you know yeah. I, I love cookies and cream but you know I like to let you too hey there you go <laughs> um what about not in Miami who's who's inspiring you that either shows you've been to or you're just seeing and just like wow like I don't get out enough no no. Um, Someone get this man a vacation. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah, I'm like, I'm a little too tunnel vision on Miami, to be honest, you yeah. know? So, what about, so you're talking about like, we're, st we're stuck in a, in a techno um, spiral, which I, I actually completely agree with you. Um, so, what sounds is inspiring you, or like, what do you, what are you liking right now? Um, what genres, any labels? I mean, I, yeah, I would say that, like, it's a lot of the sort of continuation of the kinds of sounds that I had been playing historically. Um, I, I think it's actually, like, a sort of, like, prime time to revisit some, uh, some music from when I started DJing, because there was this moment where, like, I think it was like the first major iteration of several different types of like internet centric music kind of coalescing, right? Um, you know, you have all these kinds of like histories of like different underground electronic musics, uh, some, you know, permeate outside of the their place of origin, you know, obviously like house, you know, coming out of Chicago, techno coming out of Detroit, but then you have like Baltimore club music, you know, 
uh, and you have like Jersey Club and like all these other kind of like regional vernacular musics that um, you introduce the internet and all of a sudden people are like getting into Chicago Juke and like, you know, all these different New Orleans bounce music and, and you know, like Bile Funk, like all these different sounds that kind of have are from their own sort of region um, and bringing them together and like fusing them in really creative, uh, interesting ways. It leads to interesting sets because like you could pepper in like a random dance hall track into a mostly electronic set because the music you're playing already references those rhythms, you know? So I think that there was this, this moment where like music was really fun and inventive, but then also like paid homage to its various roots. And um, yeah, just like Night Slugs fade to mind, like that kind of like that era of like, I don't know. I feel like there's never been like a actual genre name that's that's stuck, but I guess like some people would say deconstructed club or whatever. Um, I, yeah, so I think like 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 revisiting a lot of that is actually been really inspiring to me lately, and I think it, we're in like a prime spot to like start reintroducing that to audiences as well. I think the people need it. Yeah. Absolutely. Where do you get your amazing t shirts? <laughs> always the thrift store. Thrift store? Always the thrift store. You always yeah. have an impeccable button down shirt. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um What does this tattoo mean? Oh god. Well, okay. <laughs> so uh, why should why I show, you show, it? The people. I'll show it to the viewers? <laughs> um so So I see an A E. Yeah. Here. A E and then some circles. So like I said, I came from the punk scene. Um I'm sure everyone has seen the anarchy symbol. It's an A in a circle. We've all seen the like tacky hot topic version where the lines of the A extend outside of the circle. But you know, it's a s symbol that goes way back past you know the history of punk music. Um, it's a long-standing political movement. So it's usually just an A in a circle. And the lesser known symbol would be the equality symbol, which is also an E in the circle. And then there's some other kind of like circle based symbols um, that are kind of, you know, part of that broader ideology. So I was interested in ideology um, and how, you know, like we as humans apply it. Um, so that was kind of the idea of the tattoo was to deconstruct those symbols. So yes, like these are my core values. I would say I've added to them since, um, I should maybe get a tattoo that reflects that, but it's already kind of built in. So the idea was, uh, anarchy symbol, equality symbol sort of deconstructed, mm -hmm. and then also a dotted line to kind of imply that like, you know, ideology is mutable. It changes over time. It gets applied in different ways depending on context. You know, we make compromises. We work in uh, allegiance with people of other ideologies towards common goals. So there's like all these ways that like ideology is is not this like f fixed essential it thing. Be boxed. It should be fluid. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. So I just I got a tattoo to kind of like uh, remind me of where my core ideology is, but then also to like remind myself to like, you know, not become dogmatic about it. Perfect. Um, having been working with your own venue, with, you know, doing production for people, uh, what's the one thing that people do <laughs> that are attendees or whatever that drives you crazy? Um, I don't know, I'm kind of here for the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like I actually, I actually don't mind when stuff goes a little crazy. Um, I would say the thing that bothers me the most is people who don't look out for their own. So, like, Facts. if if like you know whatever, like we're you know someone's doing drugs or whatever, and like they came with a group, and then the group is kind of like, oh, they're too far gone, and they just like don't look after them. Like that bothers me, right? Because you know, the responsibility will fall on someone else or bad things might happen. So, like, that bothers me. But but otherwise, like, so long as, like, nothing bad is happening, I the like a little, happen. you know. A little anarchy? A little anarchy. <laughs> is there any projects you're working on? 
projects. Um, Working towards developing. Them. Yeah, I mean, I, I I guess like I had mentioned before that I kind of want to revisit the roots of, of autonomy and like have it be this sort of multi-format thing again. So like that's part of it for sure. Um, I do plan on doing more events soon and I, I hope that those events can can kind of touch back into some of those territories. Um, I'm also always just like working on like little things, um, little kind of like visual projects. Like I have this like uh, program that I made for um, for like visuals, like for projections for parties that I'm like I revisit every year or so to like make little tweaks and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. But that, but now that you're saying it, I'm like, I want to have more projects. <laughs> Give this boy some projects. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. What else? What else? Hmm. Is there anything you want to tell people? Anything they should know about that they don't know about you? Hmm. This is called For the Records. So this is your chance to clear the air, put the record out there. <laughs> um, totally putting you on the spot. Yeah. No, I mean... I'm I'm usually like an open book about things, mm -hmm. um, so I can't say there's anything that like I need to like you know put out into the world that I maybe haven't already. Uh, but that being said, I'm an open book, so like if you want to talk to me about anything, come talk. I'm like down to chat with whoever about literally anything. Hit up your boy. If you see somebody dancing with an iPad at the function, it's probably <laughs> this guy. Yep. Um, we sh we share something in common. Oh, we, we both just joined something. Oh yeah. Um, so I guess we're more formally involved with uh, Miami Community Radio. Um, I would say that you've been much more diligent about that in the past couple days it's than me. Been six days. <laughs> I know. See, I said couple. That's how far gone I am. Um, yeah. I I actually I hope to do um, to open some conversations about about us doing some events soon. So. That could be another project that we will talk about. Absolutely. So, yes, uh, Victor and I have joined the core team at MCR. I'm very happy to be part of it. So thank you, y'all. Y'all inspire us. So we're just we're bringing back that inspiration. Um, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. Um, I'm excited for this mix. You're about to lay on us. That makes one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, he I'm here for the clanks. I'm here for the clanks. Um, nah, you're gonna rip it, dude. Um, any closing thoughts? Um, build coalition. Build that's coalition. It. All right, that's the next collective coalition. <laughs> Let's build it together, y'all. Um, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Come here. Big hug. Ah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.